children suffer with mental health issues as well, but making them feel valued and making them feel that, do you know what, it's all right when you get things wrong? It's all right to fail? I think the first introductory to football should be about using football as a vehicle to develop their fundamental patterns, fundamental skills and things like that. We need to meet the needs of the learners that are in front of us. And we do it in three ways, in my opinion. We improve our self-awareness as a person. What is it we need to do? We try to find, you know, within, within reason, evidence-informed practice design. And we do it to meet the needs of the learners. If a kid comes to me and I ask them what their favourite subject is and they say maths, I think, well, they like problem solving then. So I'll put them in, a, I'll give them a target in a game, a practice, that will f force them to pro problem solve. People might never remember everything you say, but they'll never forget how you made them feel. And if you don't give them an opportunity to express themselves without the fear of ridicule, you'll never get the creative person that you want because they fear judgment. Welcome back to the Everyday Perspective podcast. Please like and subscribe to the channel. Today's guest is Aaron Cusack. Aaron, how are you, mate? Very well, gents. Thanks for having me. You're welcome. Thanks for coming on. Um, the plan today is to talk a little bit about I guess, football development, specifically for our kids. Mm -hmm. So very quickly, mate, can you just tell us, uh, I guess, what your various job roles are and, and what sort of role you play within football? So I've been a coach now for over 20 years. So I started just as I was released by Plymouth Argyle as a player. So I was there until I was 18, got released as a scholar. Uh, I was an apprentice back then. Um, and always had a kind of interest in development. And during my tenure with the football club, we were able to do what was back then the UEFA C license as part of our kind of development um, and enjoyed it, to be honest. And as I left the football club, I thought, well, I did like that side of things um, and wanted to kind of get back into or start really my journey in the coaching space. And that's kind of then led into my progression as a, as a professional. I now work as a senior lecturer at Plymouth Marjon University. Um, I head up our... MSc in high performance sport coaching and I've been there for 15 years or this is my 15th year I went back and my coaching route I went back and worked in Plymouth Academy at 22 when I just started my B license then um, stayed in there for 12 years um, and about seven years ago I decided to, to leave and try something new um, mainly because my, my my firstborn came to the world Theodore and um, I was seeing him less and other people's children more and I thought, hang on, do you know what? Something's got to change a bit here. You know, as much as I enjoyed the development of working with kids, I wanted to see my own child grow up, essentially. So I made the decision to leave the football club and go and work at the Independent Football Academy and head up their, their coaching syllabus, essentially. Um, uh, I've, well, towards my, it was about 10 years ago when I was in the football club at Argyle, I, I decided to enroll in my A licence because um, I felt ready. I had my B licence for like eight years. And I thought, well, what's the next step? Down here, when people say the A license, a lot of my colleagues and friends will say, well, you're brave to go on that course. He's like, well, why? You know, well, you know, it's only coaches working at Premier League teams kind of get on that. And I was like, well, I felt like I was good enough to, to go on that course and uh, did. Got my A license. I started 10 years ago, last last month. Yeah. You know, it's, it's gone so fast. Um, and then just after COVID, I started my own coaching program, which was a bit of a side hustle called A Tech Coaching which delves into the specifics of player development. So position specific, one-to-one, -one, small group stuff. And I thought there was a little bit of a gap in the market where whilst there's some good coaching going on out there, it's normally delivered en masse, you know, 16, 18, 20 in a group. And I thought actually there's a, there's a, there's a bit of a gap where players are missing out on the detail that they need to enhance their position specificity as a player. Um, so I started that and that's been going really well ever since. And what, um, age, what age groups is that you do? It's It started a bit older, so like 15s and 16s. And then more recently, I won't do any one-to-ones with players under the age of 13, because that's why they tend to go into 11 v 11. Um, and now I'm doing small group stuff with like 10s and up, really. I tend to leave alone the little ones because they don't need me at that age. They need exposure to good practice, but they just need to enjoy the game and learn the game. But when they come to me at like 12... 13, 14, where they might be in an academy or they're trying to get into an academy, I can provide them with a little bit more detail on what an academy player might look like and what it might need to kind of progress and push on. Yeah, amazing. 
So quite a bit of experience you got there then, mate. A bit, I think. Yeah, yeah a bit, <laughs> you know. Yeah, tell us about, um, I guess, your own experience as like a youth apprentice. Yeah. Tell us about that. What was that like when you were playing as a kid? So it was, when did I, it was 1998. I was a 16-year-old, yeah, going in, I know, going in as, a, as an apprentice. It was a YTS scheme back then, so the youth trainee scheme, I think it was called. And it was very similar to what Mr. Sawyer said the other week um, in that it was a kind of rite of passage of trying to become a man. And I was a boy, essentially. And it was, it was, it was an experience nonetheless. And, you know, you got given a couple of pros you had to look after. You had to do the jobs and things like that, clean the toilets, sweep the the floors, paint the tunnel, clean the minibus, all that type of stuff, which was part of your development as, you know, becoming a young adult. Um, getting a, the, the opportunity to play football every day was was fantastic. You know, people people look at it and say, well, well, you failed, you didn't make it. No, I didn't make it as a pro, but I think it helped me to become the person I am today because it prov provided me with the skills to become a professional in an educational space. Mm -hmm. Um, and I'm very proud of where I'm at now in my, in my life, you know, so I don't see it as a failure. I see it as an opportunity and experience that no one else can ever take away from me. Um, and I, hopefully I can try and provide, ev you know, experiences to players coming up through the ranks who are better than me or were better than me or are better than me. Um, but it was a, it was an interesting experience because if you look at the modern game now, it's nothing like that at all. You know, speaking to the couple of the scholars in the modern game there, they're treated very differently and rightly so. Um, I think the uh, the world has completely changed, isn't it, in terms of how young people in particular uh, are treated. Mm, yeah, absolutely. So your experience back then was probably quite different to, to what they experience now than you think. I think so. Yeah, I yeah. think I think looking how the football club, I can only speak for Plymouth, but looking how the football club is now, you know, the culture that's created, it's about um, harnessing the development, giving players the opportunity to experience what it's like to train in the first team you know they encourage they they whereas in our kind of situation it was more a case of I remember training with the first team a few times and you were there as cannon fodder <laughs> it was kind of go up right go and be in the wall while they leather balls at you right you know go in go in be part of a, a possession practice where they'll deliberately punch balls at you so someone can come in and take you out and think you know like flipping out like this isn't fair um, but that was, that was what it was. That's what we were used to. And that's what we expected. Um, so I think I'm glad now football's of a different culture because it gives people the chance to express themselves properly. Yeah. Okay. Interesting. Cause we, we spoke obviously with Gary about this and I think some of that, the sort of, um, the banter, if you like, or, or bullying for one of a better term, kind of prepared the lads for that camaraderie and the pressure of football. And we kind of just talked around the fact whether that's lost or not now, but you don't think so? Well, I think. I think the world's different. Yeah. <clears throat> so I think, you know, the what's what's interesting about what you said there is the players who have been in academy, say, from 10, 11, 12, who are now coming into senior football, I think have a better awareness of being spoken to and educated because they've had it for six, seven, eight years. Mm -hmm. So they understand that culture. Um, if you, They're not used to being shouted at. Mm -hmm. So when you start to shout and swear at them, potentially, I'm not sure they know how to cope and handle that. I'm not saying that they shouldn't be exposed to that, especially at the top end. They're playing in the elite level of the game. Pressure comes with the territory, fan pressure, peer pressure, manager pressure. You know, they're there to win games. I just think when I look back and reflect now, it could have been dealt with in a more um, appropriate way. Yeah. You know, realising that we are all human beings. We're not there. It wasn't a, this is how it's always done. Therefore, this is how you'll be treated. And when you look back at some of the stories now, it's, it was banter, but some of it was borderline questionable behavior. You know, I remember a few stories, which I, I think I'll keep to myself that were, <laughs> I'm thinking, wow, like, really? Did that, did that happen? And it did happen. And it was, I know it was banter, but when you look back now, you think, blimey, it's quite frightening to think that we weren't allowed to raise it either. Yeah. Okay. You know? Right. Interesting. All right, cool. Um, so I guess, speaking to parents, yes, obviously, you know, our primary audience are, are guys, um, you know, we're, we're parents to sons. But yeah. these days, I mean, certainly growing up, it was a dream to be a footballer. Um, these days, it's boys and girls that are aspiring to be footballers. Um, and parents obviously want to give their kids the best possible opportunities in anything they want to do. So I guess, 
taking it right back to grassroots then. So if you're a parent and you're thinking about getting your kid into football, what should you be focusing on when you're selecting like teams and and coaches and that type of thing to get your kids started in football? I think the first introductory to football should be about using football as a vehicle to develop their fundamental patterns, fundamental skills and things like that. Um, not the other way around, not going into a football team to win games at an early age. Exposure to being able to deal with an object, i.e. a football, in different situations, ball mastery, aerial control, receiving skills, all things like that. And more importantly, fun and engagement, like exposure to being able to enjoy things, be happy, um, be able to express without fear of, you know, being ridiculed in a space. Um, but more importantly, you want development, don't you? You want development for your child to make sure that they're going to be provided with the best opportunity. That doesn't necessarily mean they need to go and join the team that wins every week because winning especially in the grassroots sector, is quite dangerous in my opinion. People put a higher premium on winning than they do development. And that in itself is quite worrying in my perspective. I'll tell you for why, is because we want these children to become lifelong participants of the game. And if you just focus on winning all the time, you're going to cut quite a few of them at an early age. Their experiences of that sport is going to be tarnished because of that win at all cost mindset. Um, that will probably hinder their decision to play in the future. We want them to keep playing for, for as long as we can. Yeah, that's right. Makes sense. <laughs> yeah. yeah, it does make sense. It does. And, you know, and as a parent, it's a case of look at, if they're going to join a particular club, look at their ethos. What are their morals? What do they stand for? They'll all have a, a code of conduct. What does it represent? Um, and, 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 and just go and get a feel of it. I don't think they need to jump into one club straight away. Just go and experience a number of different programs that are on offer. And ask the child which one they enjoy. I think with my boy, I obviously I, I played for Marjons, but the the reason I I took him to Marjons was because they have equal playing time for their children. Yeah. So no matter on ability, they're equal playing time. Mm -hmm. So it, it just made sense because my lad was wasn't the best, and he's developed into an alright player now. But yeah, good. originally, you know, he was doing fucking airplanes on the pitch and just didn't wasn't really interested. But I wanted to get him into football because. It's just, I don't want him sat on his Xbox all day, mm. you know, and just doing nothing. I want him to experience a team. And now he's 11. He absolutely loves it. He's football mad. That's all mm. he does. Football, yeah. football, football. So, But those early experiences of that 100%. game time. Yeah. He wasn't the same level as the other kids. He was. But that doesn't matter. Does yeah, it? that's what I mean. But, but if, yeah. you took, if I took him to the wrong team mm. yeah. and he was just, you know what I mean, put to one side then he wouldn't be where he is now. So you got to, you, you have got to make sure that you are taking him to the right club, like you said. It's all about, the, look at the bigger picture, like you say there, you know, your, your, your lad's now 11, he's absolutely football mad. If his early experiences have been rejection, who's to say that he wanted to, didn't want to play, you know? So the equal game time for the short term might not look as um, glamorous, but for the long term, it will it will improve the longevity of people playing the game. Yeah. Some of the things that we've talked about previously, we, we've talked on, um, I guess, how a lot of kids get those sort of participation medals and that type of thing. Mm. And, and winning isn't celebrated as much as it maybe was previously. Kind of on, on what you're saying there, um, it sounds like there are some benefits to maybe doing that. But do you see any negatives to doing that as well? What, winning or so so you mentioned there sort of going at a young age it's more about participation development yeah. not winning um we've talked previously about the fact that you know there's there's been occasions where where danny's son's come home and done well at football mm. but didn't actually get a winner's medal for it do you feel that's a detriment at all i think if we put too much external reference on performance and application then people seek that external reward whereas we want intrinsic drives, don't we? We want success to be measured, not just on what you receive as a as an objective measure or an external reward, but more a case of, do you know what? I felt I did all right today. And well, why did you do well? Well, I, I beat that player or I didn't concede a goal or I had a shot on target. And for them, that's a measure of success. It doesn't have to be you are rewarded with the best player. And don't be wrong. I think winning is important because you have to compete in life to get anywhere. So it's not so much about win at all costs. It's about being able to compete and competition means winning, drawing, and losing. And, and children in all walks of life, you know, all sports in particular, but football, because we're on that topic, is they've got to learn to lose. Mm. They've got to know what it feels like to lose so that they can deal with those situations when it happens again, because it will happen again when the next time it, it occurs. Um, and in the same token, 
it's not just about being part of a side that wins 10, 12, 15 nil every week, because that's not going to develop them. They will stagnate if they play against opposition that are not at the same level. You know, I, I love it when I hear of teams who might dominate a certain age group. And they go up. And they go up a year and then they struggle because I think that's a quite a good thing for them. But because they're not used to the physical difference or, and you know, they're, they're winning a game 2-1 or they're losing a game 2-1, but they're in a game where it could go either way. And the ebb and flow of it creates character for me. Yeah. That's a really interesting perspective, actually, mate. Mm. Yeah, it's great. Um, so if you are a parent then, and you mentioned about club selection, think about the ethos of the club, and mm. where, where do you typically go to find that information? Do the clubs have websites? Yeah, there's stuff to Facebook. Have you got the DGM kind of information page that people can put information on there and I think it's quite active I think people are very supportive to help children get in and find clubs um, you know the DGM Facebook is probably the main one I won't rattle off a number of different clubs in particular I know we've got Marge on but there are other clubs out there but you know if you say my son's looking to start or my daughter's looking to start in a program can anyone recommend something people are normally quite active and willing to share and say look try this try this try this and you just go and you you know, you showcase or well, experience what's available there. Yeah, perfect. And then I guess, again, from a parent's perspective, if you're, you know, sort of hoping to support your child into achieving their goal and their dreams of being a professional footballer, if you're playing for a side that doesn't win on a regular basis, is there a danger that scouts aren't going to come and watch and they're never going to get that sort of that opportunity then to, to shine? That's a really good question, actually, because there's always that assumption that in order to get spotted, you need to be playing for the best team mm. because the scouts are going to watch the big clashes, the under 11 big clash on a Saturday yeah. morning. Um, I disagree. I think if you can, as a parent, don't worry about becoming a professional footballer because the modern adult game is completely different to what their child will be playing. Even though they're playing football, it's not the same game. It's a completely different game. They are playing an athletic, professional version of the game. Children playing 7v7, 8v8s, 9v9s is a completely different exposure. So think about, one, are they enjoying it? Two, are they seeing development? Now, whatever that means, it doesn't necessarily mean they are the best player. It means, are they enjoying themselves? Are they developing socially? Are they able to showcase some form of technical development at time? And if they are, then we've got small wins. And for me, the accumulation of the small wins will create a greater overview or a holistic development for that child. Yeah. In time, if they start to show a bit of promise, where and what I mean by that is they're starting to show consistency in their individual performance for their team, and they might begin to outstretch the team they're playing for, then I think it's time to have a discussion about, okay, is there somewhere else for them to either continue to develop, i.e. with a development program, that the Argyle C of E or the Independent Football Academy or something of that ilk, or go to a, a different side. I understand that. And, and I'm, I'm not also of the belief that a child needs to stay with the same side all the way up through their youth development if that side is not hindering their development, but they could flourish elsewhere. Mm -hmm. And I think that comes with communications with coaches, with their, their child in particular, you know, what do they want to do? And his, and his discussions as a family as well. Mm, yeah, amazing. All right, brilliant, good advice. So as a child, I guess, moves into their teenage years mm. um, and you start getting these things like you've obviously got the sort of biological age, but then you've actually got that sort of physical age where two 11 year olds, two 13 year olds just aren't the same. Yeah. Like as, as a coach, like how do you, how do you kind of potentially manage that and, and what sort of traits do you look for? And I guess for parents, at what point do you want to start thinking about the adult version of the game? And starting thinking about sort of the athletic attributes of a, of a young player. Yeah, no, so 16 really is when they're naturally going to start to progress into young adult football. You know, 16-year-olds progressing out of DJM. I know some that might play under 18s, but they go into maybe a second team or a third team to cut their teeth in, in senior football. You know, research out there suggests that children can start doing conditioning activities from the ages of eight. And above. I'm not saying they need to get in the gym and start lifting heavy weights per se, but just we look at S&C as the assumption that you're in a gym lifting weights. But if we take away the strength of the S and can focus on the C conditioning, doing conditioning based activities can be done with a football, mm -hmm. learning to land on one leg, learning to push off of the same leg, you know, so, you know, you guys know that yourselves as PTs. So, you know, I think as long as your parents can become aware of, they can learn this themselves. There's a, there's a raft of information on on the internet about 
physiological development, maturation. You know, the golden window of fundamental movement skills, according to research, is around about 10 years old. So giving them the exposure to a variety of activities. Now, I'm of the big belief that children should do a multitude of sports the younger they are. Don't just put all your eggs in one basket and assume, I want to be a footballer, therefore I'm going to play football. They need to go and do a number of different sports because the movement patterns are different and it makes them more uh, rounded the older they get, you know, and, and there's a, there's some literature out there. They call it kind of main sport and then donor sport. So if you look at some professionals who have gone on to become elite performers, top of their game, they had a donor sport that supported their main sport as they went up through. So you look at people like um, Djokovic, you know, he did a lot of skiing, you know, so he did his tennis, he did a lot of skiing. But if you think about the lateral movements that they do in tennis, you can see the crossover from skiing, essentially. Yeah. Um, Ibrahimovic was, you know, a footballer and martial arts. So he did a lot of kind of taekwondo. And if you look at a lot of the stuff on YouTube of Ibrahimovic, how kind of creative his movements were. You so can, agile, isn't he? You can relate them back to his martial arts background, yeah. you know, so there's lots of crossover. So if you're, you know, if you're pretty serious about development and you want to think about how things can aid the primary sport, encourage ch children to maybe do other sports that might help to support it long term. It's really interesting you said that when I, when, when Jack was doing jujitsu regularly, as well as playing football, mate, it's movement. I, I noticed the difference because he's quite stiff and he's, he's very like, he's not very flexible. And, um, as soon as he was doing jiu-jitsu and just the warm-ups of just doing front rolls, mm -hmm. cartwheels, uh, all that type of stuff. He, at first, he went the first week, he couldn't do any of it really. And then by like six or seven weeks, he was he was doing it all. Mm -hmm. but then I noticed it in his football, like he just was moving better. And then he stopped and now I, I watched him the other day and I was like, he's stiff again. So I was like, <laughs> I say, you know what, hey, you're going back to jiu-jitsu. And he doesn't really, he likes jiu-jitsu, but he doesn't love it like he loves football, no. right? But I want to encourage him to do it for that exact reason, because it, I, I've seen such a difference in his movement. Yeah, and it's, it's spot on because it's the transfer, you know, and you, you think about um, development, you know, your son's about to go through his, his growth and he's starting to mature so that the coordination is going to be hindered because his bones are going to grow and his brain's not used to longer bones and things like that. And they look like they can't coordinate their movement patterns. It will come back, as you know. But the, it's for me, it's learning how to land and roll and fall. You know, Jiu-Jitsu, I'm assuming, is a form of grappling and all yeah. and things like that. So learning how to roll and get up again, he does that on a football pitch probably week in, week out, where he's losing his balance, having to catch his balance in space, roll, stand up. It makes him more athletic. Yeah. You know, and the crossovers are... Uh, are endless really and I, I can't stress enough the importance to ensure that at the younger age a multitude of experiences of sports do you yeah. um uh, to pause to, to pause question do you ever find um children obviously at around that sort of like 12 13 sort of age that so was like they, some of them get big mm -hmm. some of them get small how do you as a coach look at how they taking their physical attributes aside and really focus on their technique yeah. because there can be times I remember like I grew quite quickly. Mm. I remember about 13, 14, I grew and I was pretty much bigger than everyone. And then I went for a two or three year period where I was, I was, I was good at the, that age, if yeah. that makes sense. Yeah. But realistically there was people better than me, but they were just smaller. How do you, how do you cope with that as a coach? Because it must be really hard because you've got one lad who's, who's doing really, really well, yeah. but you can see a lot of it is through physical attributes. By the time they're 18, they're all going to be pretty much the same there or thereabouts. Yeah. The underdog theory, really the, the focusing on technique, you get technique ingrained early. We can add on muscle and power as they get older. Yeah. If you've got the other way around, I think you're going to struggle, right. you know, because we, as adults, we find it harder to, um, develop technique more seamlessly because of the fact that we're ending coming towards the end of our full maturation. Whereas when they're in their early infancies of development, you know, they got that golden window where they're absorbs, absorbing all that information and they're able to kind of refine technique early. So what I do with, um, if I'm working with kids like 11 year old, one who's four foot three and the other one who might be pushing five foot 11, for me, it's not about how big they are. It's about how well they can protect their space. So I, when I'm working with, with younger children in particular, in a 1v1 scenario, I'll do a 1v1 setup where we work on a clock face. So if I'm, if I'm now the player with the ball looking at you, you're a 12 o'clock pressure point if I want to go past you. If I now turn around, you're behind me, you're now a six o'clock pressure point, I want to go that way. So learning how to move in space and to use your body as a barrier 
will allow you to create a skill set for my body to be able to escape that pressure point. And for me, it's about balance points. If I can teach children, and I'm pretty good, you know, for my work in uni with biomechanics and stuff like that, I understand balance points. I understand where if the head stays here, you're likely to remain balanced in this position. If your head goes here, you're likely to be unbalanced. So I get them to feel it. And then we, they, I have to expose them to the pressure point. So the physical contact, start with technique, layer the physical bits in, and in time you merge the two together as they grow. You've got a combination of someone who can control their space, who are physically strong. It's pretty good. I've never, I've never heard that control the space and, and stuff like that. I just never, control the space. Just, yeah, that's just really learn. cool. So little ones, it's all right. They can do it. Kids are quite tenacious, aren't they? Yeah, you know, yeah. they, they like the the, yeah. the the challenge of overcoming someone who's bigger and stronger. If you're in a foot race and you're in a parallel run and the big one goes like that, there's a good chance that they're going to, you know, topple and go. But if you can be clever and learn to get across and grapple and and you know, one, I'll, I'll give you an example. I did a session with a young player this week, and young children in particular don't back pedal very well. So we talk about the nature of football when they run backwards. They have a tendency to lead with their head. So when they backpedal, they're running, their head goes that way. Mm. So if I play a ball into them, if their head is leading the backwards direction, as soon as they touch the ball, they'll lose their balance because they touch it and fall. Mm. All we do is, all I got him to do is just basically get his bum to lead, you know, for want of a better term. Yeah. Just put your bum in front, not your head. And they get into not a full squat, but more of a partial squat position. Yeah. But because their head stays between their feet, as the ball comes in, they receive, they kill it. Mm. So it's just a slight change in their mechanics. You know, so it's it's about developing that that kind of movement model. That's not just about straight line stuff. It's about twist and turning, which is what football invasion games is all about, isn't it? Twisting and turning and being able to catch yourself in space. Yeah, no, it's interesting. It's really cool. It's funny as you talk. We obviously touched about the the kind of different different sort of disciplines in sports. Yeah. In jiu-jitsu, we constantly talk about pressure, head control, and head know, position. I thought exactly yeah. the same. And then I'm thinking, Jack's, Jack's back, mate. Yeah. <laughs> no, you're right. Head, it's, like, it's exposure. You can see it depends on what people want. It's if, fascinating. You know, like my, my son, for example, he's he's eight years old and he, he isn't bothered about football, which he likes it, but I won't push him into playing football. I'll do what he wants to do and he, he can take it or leave it. And we, we go to a little kick around every Tuesday a um, place called Swift, which I think is brilliant. It's run by John Noyce and, he, and, and, and Dan O'Connor. And I think they're fantastic. Um, and he loves it. But when we finish on that Tuesday night, he won't kick a ball again until the next session, which is absolutely fine. I love it. You know? Honestly, my lad, I know, I said a few, but he was exactly the same. Yeah. So I would take him to football and then he was not really interested until about, about two years ago. I think it kind of changed. And then, then it was like all the time, you know, yeah. but it's one of those things that you just got to let them do what they want to do. I well, said to him before, I was like, you've got to, my thing was you've got to play a sport or you've got to be active in some way. So you can choose what you want to do. If you want to play rugby, if you want to do this or that or whatever you want to do, but you're not sat at home just doing nothing. Mm. I think it's important for them to have a team sport or have a sport that they do just yeah. to be active and to, yeah. again, <laughs> grow as a person. Yeah. But. Yeah, I, I, would, I was exactly the same. I'd let him choose whatever he wants to do. It is important, I think, because I think you're then doing it for the wrong reasons. If, yeah. you're, if you're dragging them there and they don't want to go, then why, why are we doing this? Is it because this, isn't, this is his life, not mine? Mm -hmm. Just because I'm a football coach and I'm working in that space, I don't want to push him towards something that he doesn't enjoy and has a passion for. You know, and that's, that's you know, I speak for millions of parents, no doubt, who have the same ilk. You know, I'm not professing to be any different, but we, I think that's- But there's some that's different though. There's some, there's, there's the other ones. You yeah. see them on a Saturday, they're, they're forcing their kids to be there. They're, you know, and they're the ones I think just fucking leave them alone. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Because they don't want to be there and that's actually going to put them off long term. And it's also goes back to our, they take them to certain clubs for the kudos of saying my son plays for X and Y. Oh, yeah. oh, that's not actually the right place for them at this stage. Oh, yeah. 100%. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. What would you so, say to those parents, mate? Ask, ask themselves why they're going there. Who's it for? Is it for the child? Is it for themselves? Is it the kudos are saying, my son plays for this team, X, Y champions, etc. You know, when we fast forward 10 years, no one cares how, who won the league at under 12 or things like that. It's not about chasing plastic trophies. It's about development. You know, I see myself as an educator. You know, I'm not a football coach. I coach people to play football, to educate them. If I can't educate them, I'm not doing my job. Yeah. And that's how I, I see it. Yeah, no, good. Um, going back to the... Um I guess these sort of uh, technical traits that you talked about a moment ago. Yeah. Um, people talk about sort of talent um, and, and we've talked a lot about development. 
those sort of traits, those sort of, um, I guess, body awareness, movement, um, do you do you feel talent's a real thing or is it literally just exposing kids to sport from a young age and, and putting them in the right places? Genetics plays a part, absolutely. You know, the, the nature versus nurture kind of debate will last forever. And, you know, I'm not of the ilk, it's 50-50. I think it depends on the circumstance. It depends, it's contextual. Every child is different. Every person is different. Exposure is massive. You know, some people get... Um, earlier exposure than others others graft their way to their to their craft you know the, the the street footballer the one who plays perhaps who comes from a more socially economically deprived area the one who's out from you know morning till 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 night playing in the streets with his mates they're the ones who, who play off the cuff a little bit they're the maverick type players and I think there's still a space for that I think coaching in the more modern world has become a little bit too structured there's the assumption that in order to make it as a pro, you have to go to a development program. Not necessarily. You just need to expose yourself to, you know, different formats of it. You know, and what we don't want to do is we don't want to create robots. We don't want to, you know, the, the, if you look at the top end academy now, there has been discussions recently about some academies are just churning out the same type of player. I was about to say that. They, they do seem very robotic, don't They're they? They're very robotic. It's, and I'm not speaking for a particular academy no, at all. No. Just the general insight. And yeah. It's all years. the same coaching, same pattern, same type of play. Yeah. And it's all, it's all filtering through, isn't it? Yeah. The same type of way. Yeah. You know, and I, if, I'm not at an academy anymore. And I would like to expose players to different formats. So I would, I'd, you know, I think this is important. Players in an academy, 15, for example, yeah, winning plays a part, I get it. But on the occasion, go away with just, a, I think some academies do it. They go away with just 11 players yeah. and say, so we've got a bare 11. And they, they go on four hours on a bus and go, right, we're, we're playing to, to, to not lose today. And I think that's really vital because I think you also have to look at the first team. So if you look at some professional setups, if the first team don't play the way this expansive football, what are we preparing them for? if they're assets to that football club. So I'm not saying that they should just all start boshing it long and things like that. But I think what we need to do is expose them to real life scenarios. You know, 99.9% .9 of all academy players will end up playing non-league football anyway. And that's, you know, the, the, we've got to get them prepared for that space. Yeah, okay. yeah non-league football is brutal. <laughs> it is, it is, you know, and it, is, it, it exposes you to it, you know. But if you look at the, the higher levels of non-league now, players can earn good luck, good luck. Oh, good really living. good. You know, the local ones here, Truro, Parkway, you know, they're, they're earning good money, and but they've got good jobs with it. So for 10 years of their life, they're going to real have a comfortable s surrounding. So when it goes back earlier about when you get released from a football club, you haven't failed because I see a lot of players who left at 15, 16, 17 are all playing like step two, step three football now, which is fantastic. And I love to see it because it, it means that they've pushed on and they're able to command a, a fee and play at a very good level. Yeah, yeah good, great. Um, so going back to the, the S&C thing there, strength and conditioning. So as kids sort of get a bit older and start pushing towards that that sort of age of 16, maybe when yeah. they start moving into more men's football, how important do you think strength, physical strength is at that point? Physical strength, yes, because you need the, the foundation of strength to be able to then become powerful, don't you? Yeah. But I think we need better education for those that are serious about playing a good level. If you've got someone who isn't bothered about, they just enjoy playing football, they're not bothered about becoming a better player per se. You know, we're talking about good non-league, you know, even step four, step five, decent standards. It's very good standards. You know, yeah. it's decent yeah. standards and you've got to play. If people are serious at young age, if they're serious about coming, becoming better players, don't just go in the gym and do squats, do dumbbell presses. Think about what movements you would do on a pitch that would help you to become more, more athletic. So, you know, combination of strength and plyometrics, for example, uh, can we get into that a little bit? Because we're just thinking yeah. about the sort of the, the layman who might be listening, yeah. uh, the parent, maybe even the, the young player now. Plyometrics, they, they probably don't know what that is. And you touched on power, yeah. which is a really good point, actually, because I, I hadn't thought about it. But of course, power is probably more important than anything. Um, can you maybe just explain very quickly the difference between, I guess, strength, speed, power, mm -hmm. and then maybe sort of the role that plyometrics, well, what plyometrics is and how that then converts to power yeah, and sure. strength. So, so strength, as we know, is being able to overcome a resistance. And if we want absolute strength, it's the rate in which the object moves. The slower it is, the harder it should be to, to pull. So we're building a strength base. So overcoming a resistance in a slow way, which only allows us to do maybe two, three reps, etc. As we move up a continuum, if we lighten the load, we should in time be able to pull that load 
quicker. So we're moving towards the elements of speed. If we take the load off completely and we move as maximally as and as quickly as possible over the shortest duration of time, then we're moving towards speed. Power is the combination of the two. So we're able to move a load as quickly as possible in a controlled way. Plyometrics is more bounding movements. So being able to jump, being able to um, change direction, to push in a more um, continued way where our contact time with the ground is reduced. And we can't really get there until we've got a strength base. So, you know, we don't need to go out this afternoon and start doing loads of plyometrics because it might lead to injury because the body isn't conditioned enough. You know, I'm not saying that you need to be experts in your field, but it's just trying. And this perhaps message goes to young footballers as well, not necessarily just parents. Try to learn more about how strength training, power training can can help their own game. And think you, they might come across terms like rate of force development. You know, the rate of force development, the quicker we can move a force, the more powerful we can become. But not only that, the quicker we can absorb a force, the better our bodies will become conditioned wise to limit the chances of injury. So if you look at the modern day Premier League now, there's a raft of um, literature going out about training athletes to decelerate better, especially in the female game. You know, trying to decelerate in a, in a controlled manner. Because is, that, it, is that because of the ACLs? ACLs in particular, yeah, because of, you know, I'm not an expert in that field and, and things like that. So being able to control, you know, decelerate quickly in a controlled way um, to to prevent injury. They're not all, they're not going to eradicate injury, but to, to condition the body. Because if we think the game now, sport in general, is as athletic as it's ever been. It's as quick as it's ever been. If we only concentrate on developing the forward or push motion of it and we neglect the reduction the deceleration at some point something's going to break yeah. and normally it's internally it's the body yeah i think with females they've got the they've got the sort of extended q angle quad angle and it just yeah puts in the end a bit more load so yeah well there, there's been a raft of, mm. of acl injuries over yeah. the last two years that's uh, it's probably always been there but now the women's game's coming into the spotlight a lot more they're noticing all these top players are just boom, just all getting these ACL injuries. And yeah. They're yeah. doing a lot of studying at the moment, trying to trying to work out exactly how to stop it, I imagine. Like they're trying to I think you're right. I think uh, it was in because you're right, it's been an explosion in injuries. But I think someone produced a I don't know if they did a systematic review, but they said over the course of like ten years, when you compare it to male and females, the rate of N ACL injuries isn't that different. Mm. Okay. But because like you've said, there's that the female game's got a lot more exposure recently. It's heightened. I'm not to say that there isn't no, any yeah. reason. I think you're right with Females tend to have wider hips, so therefore their femurs are, are, are more inclined to have a, a sharper Q angle. I think there's something to do with the menstrual cycle as well. They were saying that when they were, yeah, when they, right the, it, soften, a bit it softens it. Yeah, yeah, softens yeah so I'm not an expert. Stuff, yeah. I'm not going to comment any more uh, than yeah, that. But it's yeah. interesting to learn. More I was about I was reading it. an article on it a few months ago. I remember. Yeah. I was, it's just fascinating to read, isn't it? Yeah. And it's like fucking hell. Yeah, really good. Yeah. You know? All right, thanks, mate. That was a really good explanation. I, I think of. of I guess S and C and, and power and development, um, and you touched on injuries there and preventing injuries. Mm. Um, if you do have a young player and they've you know the life football, and they've now got injured, any advice on how a parent might manage that from both a, a physical and psychological perspective? First of all, rest isn't the cure. Okay. So I'm not saying they need to get back to full activity straight away, but mobility and regaining the strength in that injured area is key as well. Yeah. You know, again, I'm not, a, I'm, not, I'm not an expert in the field of rehabilitation, mm -hmm. but my master's is in sport and exercise medicine. So I have a, a, a fair element of knowledge to support what I'm saying. Um, you know, it's different if you've got a leg break, then yes, casting and rest and things like that. But if you've got like an injury tear or, a, um, you know, an ankle twist and things like that, the key element is to start the rehabilitation when allowed to do so as early as possible. It's not, I'll just sit on the sofa for a week and then they'll be all right. Because if we think about a muscle tear, as you know, the fibers tear and the body wants to repair itself. So what it does is it creates a mesh over that tear to prevent, to, to stem the, the blood flow, you know, to stem the, the bleed. And then if we just rest for three weeks like that, and we haven't done any manipulation on it, when we go to go again, it's just going to tear. So what we need to do is get that manipulation going and get that movement going. A colleague of mine at uni likened it to a piece of paper. It was really interesting. He took a, a piece of A4 paper and he just tore the side of it. And then he turned it landscape and he was pulling it. And he was saying, well, there's a tear, but that muscle is still working. So what we need to do is still activate that muscle 
but be mindful of our range to allow that tear to heal. And I thought it was a really good analogy to use. Um, so I think if you're if you're coming back from injury, mobility is is key. You know that I think the old um, acronym of rice is it rest ice compression elevation it, yep. is kind of a thing of the past yeah, i think it's, it's more kind of, police now it's more it? like if anything uh, yeah do something else you'd know more that more about it than i will but you know whereas before it was like oh yeah rest up put your foot up lay down yeah. <laughs> i know we need to elevate and get the compression on but you need to get back active quickly it's really weird to say that so many years me playing football that's all i've done rice yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah rice, all the time you've you probably done it the same yeah, didn't yeah. you, you know yeah, yeah. yeah. especially those early years of like football you'd have your physio at whatever club you're at and they'd yeah. go right Rice, let's, right. uh, let's do it, it, you know, and, and we, that's what you've we, done. We did what we were told. It was like, oh, that must be the cure. And now you're like, okay, well, that's not necessarily the case. Yeah, so I think police is a, is a, is a, a, a sort of more recent one, and that's you still going to protect it, so that's the P, yeah. and then it's optimal loading, mm -hmm. and then you there still are, manage yeah. the inflammation yeah. with everything yeah. else. So, it's uh, yeah, it's good. And how about from a psychological perspective? Because I know um, from, a, from a, you know, coming from a slightly sort of slight rehab background, yeah, Obviously, sort of um, social isolation and that thing can be a real issue. Um, so, would you encourage kids to still get down to watch practices and be around their, their teammates and that type of? Oh, million percent. Yeah. yeah. If, if I was the coach, I'd get them actively involved. Okay. Because they learn about the game as well. Yeah. So, you know, I've had I've had players. I, I did a session. You know, I think it was Easter half term, and, and a kid come down, bless him, and he he was about fifteen, sixteen, and he was injured, but he didn't want to tell me he was injured. And he couldn't, he couldn't train. I said, well, why have you, why? Oh, I didn't want to let you down. So I was like, right, well, you're with me today then. He said, what do you mean? So you're with me, you're, you're going to coach. And he was, what? So we gave him exposure to, right, what, what would you do here? Because he's a central midfield player and we were doing some midfield practices. So come on, well, you play the game. Well, well I would, I'd stand here. Well, okay, well, listen to, you know, such and such and we'll do that. Yeah. And it gave him such a different exposure, a different lens. He was buzzing at the end. You know, and he was injured. Seeing the other side of it, isn't it? Yeah. For him, seeing the other side. The other side, the so lens of what we see. Yeah. Well, what would you do? Well, I would go here. Well, okay, well, let's build your practice then. And they build their practice from that. Yeah. So I think definitely get involved because if we think about it from a social perspective, they feel involved. What we don't need is a coach isolating them, saying we don't need you today. I'm sure there's not a coach in the land. I'd like to think there isn't one in the land that would, would not invite their player if they're injured to come and be involved in it. Yeah. Um, but definitely get involved and think about, you know, I appreciate there's different extens extensions of injuries. You know, someone who's got a leg break compared to someone who's got a twisted ankle might be different in terms of their rehab um, schedule. But try and think about the future, yeah. you know, see it as a challenge to get fit. You know, use that as motivation to say, right, this is my discipline now. I'm going to learn more about this injury. I'm going to learn how to rehab. I'm going to go and seek professional help. And I'm going to go and give it my best shot. Yeah, no, good advice, mate. And yeah, I agree. I think it's very important um, to, to still manage the the mentality of an injured yeah. person, but player, certainly young yeah, player. Yeah. Um, on, on the on the tone of, of sort of psychology and everything else, um, I hear loads of stories about kids as they, they're, they're really talented, doing really well. And as mm. they start getting older, they start going off the path a little bit, not always to find other sport, but, you know, just girls, whatever yeah, it might sure. be. Any advice to parents in regard to managing, I guess, the mindsets and mentalities of, of players as they start to mature a little bit? I think understand that when they go through puberty and maturation, it's not just physical. There's mental maturation, there's psychological maturation. You know, the brain is a fabulous thing, it's part of our body. And, you know, it's the, the, the research suggests that the adult brain doesn't fully form until the early 20s. And the, the front part of the brain the prefrontal cortex doesn't, that's the thing that matures the, at last, the last part of it. Um, so if we think about, and that's responsible for our higher order thinking, our decision-making, our rational thought. So when we see as fully fledged adults, a child making quite an irrational, impulsive decision, whether it's playing football or whether it's in life, we have to think that their brains aren't fully mature yet. So if we can learn more about that and try to understand it from their perspective, then it helps us, I think, to understand them more as a player. I mean, a, a, car, a, a great example is a traditional football coach shouting on a pitch saying, Paul, why did you do that for? What, why has he done that? I have no... And then when you actually think about it, if he's 13 years old, mm -hmm. his prefrontal cortex is nowhere near developed yet, yeah. whereas ours is. Mm -hmm. So we can see it in a more rational way. They can't. Yeah. So the reason they make that decision is based on their impulse yeah. and their perception of that situation. Yeah. So if we can learn more about the fact that it's not just physical maturation that they're going through, it's also psychological maturation, they can, we can understand them as a human a bit more. Yeah. And I think the other thing is to communicate. Yeah. 
how are you feeling? I, what's, you know, the one thing I try to do all the time when I work with players is I connect with them. Mm-hmm. I think I'm really good at building relationships. If the football comes afterwards. Mm-hmm. If I can get them to trust me and I, and I get them to, and the one thing I do invest a lot of time in when I coach is I care. I really care about the player I'm working with, whether it's one-on-one or whether it's a group, I really care about them. And I, I, I go out my way to learn more about them as a person brothers, sisters, dogs, when their birthday is, who their favourite player is, what their favourite subject is. Because if, if, if a kid comes to me and I ask them what their favourite subject is and they say maths, I think, well, they like problem solving then. So I'll put them in, a, I'll give them a target in a game, a practice, that will f- force them to pro- problem solve. Mm-hmm. You know, so if, I, if I've got someone who likes art, they, they're creative. Mm-hmm. So I'll give them a situation where there's more than one outcome. So they try and pick the outcome. So it's just trying to learn more about the child and, and educate them from that perspective and then I'll layer in the football practice from there. Yeah, yeah it's really that's interesting. Fascinating. That's, that's fascinating, mate. That's yeah. amazing. It's, it's amazing. It's amazing. Like, I'm sat here, like, learning. <laughs> <laughs> um, just, um, just sort of putting my, my head into maybe that of a parent who might be watching mm. and you just touched on the fact that obviously young players, uh, they, they don't have the same level of rationale that maybe a, 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 an adult would have because it's still developing. This goes back a little bit, I guess, to what we touched on earlier where, you know, a, a parent might be trying to encourage a, a young player to keep playing or get into football and the young player doesn't want to. Yeah. You said, obviously, you know, they need to, to be allowed to make that choice. What would you say to a parent that would then argue it, that they're making the wrong choice and they don't understand because they're young and they're not developed yet and they need to listen to me as a parent because I know best? Again, it's a good question because I think it's not, I don't, believe and we're all parents ourselves we can just let them run free yeah. we've got to have some element of rain where we say okay we you can be as selective as you want within these parameters mm. um, it depends I, I'll try and look at it as a consequence so what's the consequence of their decision so let, let's keep it in a football context if they opt to go and join a team just to play with their mates and the team that they play for are one of the less able sides around, you know, they're, they're maybe scrambling down the, the third tier in the bottom of the league. And in the same token, they want to be a professional footballer. You have to think about the consequence, the exposure that they're going to go into. You're going to go, so, okay, that's fine. That's your decision. But be aware that you're going to go and play with your friends who might not have the same drive and passion as you, having got the same um, aspirations of becoming a professional footballer, the best footballer they can be. The quality of opposition is going to be poorer. Um, the, the resources and perhaps the education is going to be poorer. So as long as they're aware of that and if they're fully intent on making that decision, then I think you've got to let them experience it a little bit. Um, but if it's a life choice, then it's different, isn't it? Mm. Um, you know, children, as they become young adults, will experiment with things. Mm-hmm. I think as long as you can, we can only do so much as parents, can't we? At some point, we have to let them go. They become their own person. As long as we can guide them to the best of our ability and we feel that we can, we've given them the best start in life, it's, it's up to them to kind of find themselves a little bit. Yeah, yeah. You know, okay. I'm sure we've all been here where we've we've made irrational decisions in our younger days, you know, and then when you look back now and you go, okay, well, we've turned out all right, haven't we? So, you know... It, you find your feet eventually. Yeah, no, good. So it just really goes back to the communication thing again, like exactly. you said. Just, yeah. just sit down and talk to them. Yeah. You know, don't get into, I'm not, again, I'm not trying to profess, I know everything about parenting, but just, I try to speak with my children and say, look. With those parents, do you have any advice or any, anything that they can kind of look towards for their kids to, when they're like shouting at them on the pitch and, you know, like you get that parent who's really aggressive and, you know, towards their ch- child, do you have any sort of like views on stuff like that? My my insight from a football perspective is normally children are products of their environment. So as a parent, perhaps consider improving self-awareness. So how we perceive ourselves and how we act can be two different things. So maybe ask the child, how do I come across on a match day in particular? What, what You know, I've had parents and children who I've worked with who, who, whose dads won't watch the, the parent, the kid won't let their dad watch. You know, they'll say, well, because it's just too aggressive. It's too, pre- too much pressure. Yeah. You know, no they, no, they, and I'll bring them. So do you watch Saturday? No, we, I don't watch, or I won't watch training. Why? Well, they don't like me watching or, well, there's a lip, there's a bit of a red flag there for me. Yeah. And again, I'm not questioning people's decisions on what to do, but I'm thinking, well, why are we doing it? 
You know, how, how is it making the child feel? And it goes back to my kind of educator hat on like people, people might never remember everything you say, but they'll never forget how you made them feel. And if you don't give them an opportunity to express themselves without the fear of ridicule, you'll never get the creative person that you want because they fear judgment. I see lots of kids where as soon as they do something, the first where on a game, the first thing they look at is the sideline. So they, they misplace a pass yeah. and they look there. So what was, how, how would you combat that then? I think it's, it's, it's speaking with the child and say, why do you look at me? Yeah. And if they say, because I fear that you're going to shout at me, then it, I think we need to be open and more aware to say, wow, is that how you perceive me? And yeah, it is. Wow, I need to change. I need to change. But if we don't have that communication, we're, we're just going to act how we think we should act. And that might not be the right thing for that child. You know, people take information on in different ways. Yeah. Okay. You know. Yeah. That's, that's such good advice. Um, so if you are a parent and you're on the sidelines mm -hmm. and you do want to encourage and be verbal, um, what, what is, you know, what, what sort of things you want to be saying? Because I, I, I'm assuming as a coach, you don't want some dad coaching on the sideline. No, oh, I was about to say, God. Yeah. <laughs> they, when they say shoot from like yeah. stupid, yeah. <laughs> stupid places yeah, yeah. or pass. Yeah. Yeah. It, uh, one of the things that really frustrate me this is just me venting a little bit as we think, but one of the things as a coach, when a lad has got a half decent position, he's took on a player, he's running towards a goal and straight away, the parents on the shine, shoot, pass, pass. And then they, they don't end up making the right decision because they become flustered. Paralysis for analysis. Yeah, 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 yeah. So yeah, so what, so yeah, so just going back to being a parent on the sideline, I want to give my kid the best support, be verbal, but not, hinder the coach or the player what 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 should i be saying and doing um in all fairness if i'm if i'm a parent and i'm not part of the coaching structure i shouldn't say anything other than praise okay in my opinion yeah. i don't need to be given my child advice on what they should be doing yeah. that's the coach's job i think if we have too many chiefs on the sidelines shouting what they should be doing you know one of the worst things i see is when another parent is telling another child what they should be doing and I'm thinking, well, what place have you got to, to say that, you know? And, and sadly, we, we, all, we all lead on emotion, yeah? So we get, we get heavily invested emotionally on the sidelines because we want the best for our children. We want them to win. We jump up and down when they score and we blame them and when they lose. And, you know, we shout, don't, not there when the ball's in and around the box. And I'm thinking, no, no, please escape. I love, like, we, where I coach, we, if they boot it clear, we stop it and bring it back in and say, no, 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 you don't just kick it clear. You learn to escape. Because it doesn't matter if they concede a goal, it's all right. It's different in the World Cup or first team, you know, Argyle and whatnot. But just learn to control that emotion. And I think it's important for, for um, a parent to have, I think timing's key. Knowing where and when to say something um, is vital. But if you've put faith in the coach because you've taken your child along to that structure because you feel that's the best for them, you shouldn't then be giving your viewpoints constantly because it, for me, undermines the coach. Yeah. All right. Perfect. Hopefully that uh, will help some people out there yeah. watching. Um, so just from a coach's perspective there, mate. So um, that that's kind of maybe support anybody that's watching and might be looking to develop young players yeah. from a coaching perspective. So you've, you've touched throughout this conversation on a couple of drills and stuff you do. So if you're a coach and you're looking to create a really good sort of training program or development program, what, what would that look like? Foundation phase, so the early ones, so like fives through to kind of 11, as much ball mastery exposure as possible and less players on the pitch. So we work on a carousel of developing. So we're about to start a new theme called developing the escape artist. So I like to create uh, syllabuses that encourage themes or principles rather than you must do a passing practice because there's so much variation you can get from a principle as opposed to a particular prescribed activity. So develop the escape artist. So can you escape on your own against another player, 1v1? Can you escape with a partner against another player, 2v1? Can you escape in a 2v2? Can you escape and combine in a 4v4? Can you escape in a 1v3? So all different scenarios. Because we think about the game, it's not perfect is it no, there's never. always situations that are 1v1s there are 1v3s I'm overloads. facing the wrong way overloads, overloads underloads yeah. things like that so give them as much exposure as you can on small pitches like if I had my way 
tens and nines and under would play as many 3v3 tournaments as possible. And I would also like to play lots of underload, overload competitions as well. And do the, I'm not familiar with that term, under and overload. So is that? A, a, basically a five versus four. Right. Or a four versus five. In, in, a f- in a pitch, you create um, overloads as a manager at certain areas of the pitch to try and, yeah, just, just to create an yeah. overload to, for an advantage. Yeah. But then that creates an underload sometimes somewhere else. Yeah. So it's transitions and it's, yeah. I, we ran a tournament like a couple of years ago and we invited a few teams in and, and I said I wanted to do it differently. And we said, look, it's not result. I put all the parents in and said, the result, we don't, we're not recording scores. It doesn't matter about that, but we're doing different formats, i.e. our team will play your team first. For the first half, you're going to have two more players than we are. Second half, we'll have two more players than you will. And we have different size pitches. We had long and thin pitches and a short and narrow pitches. And then we had lots of 3v3s going on. Um, and the best bit for me was we had a, two 6v6 teams and we had three pitches we had um, a 1v1, a 2v2, and a 3v3. And they, as a team, had to select who was going to go and play the 1v1 first, who was going to play the 2v2, and who was going to play the 3v3. And I had a couple of comments. I heard a couple of comments of people walk past and go, that's not football. And I thought, well, okay, well, what, what's football to them? You know, these kids are nine years old. <laughs> what's football? It is football. It's exposing them to different variants of it, learning to deal with an underload you know, and what was brilliant about it, both sets of teams, were in, so some managers embraced it brilliantly. Um, when, when we called in afterwards, we said about the kids and the kids were, were, were when they had less players, they were, they were thinking about counterattacks mm. without any coach input. Well, well, we were going to sit, we sat deep and we left one up and when we got it, we just pinged <laughs> it and we let it run after it. I thought, how, how well, how good is that to manage a situation? It didn't come from the coach, it came from the players. And then when they had more players, it was like, well, no, we've got more players in them, so let's like kind of be a little bit more attacking and, and try and take it to them. It was, it was fabulous, you know, it was fabulous. They get so much social connection. Just, as well. just on that, what do you think the the difference is between some players who are very good in small sided games, but mm. they don't transfer over very well to the bigger eleven aside? I've, I've known a few players over the years that have been fantastic five aside players, yeah. and and they've got everything in their locker, and then they get to eleven aside game, and they just haven't got the same. I don't know. It doesn't. Have, they don't have the same impact in a, in a game, and yeah. there's and there's a few players like that in there yeah. around. Yeah, and I just absolutely. I just wanted to know your views on that because I never really understood it. And mm. I, you know, you, you seem to know fucking ten times more than me about coaching and about <laughs> things like that. So time, just <laughs> one time. No, but being serious, yeah, like yeah. What what do you think that is there any probably exposure, Dan? To be honest, the fact that they play loads of five aside, really they're good at it, and they enjoy it, and they get lots of return. They probably don't do the other bits of the eleven v eleven game as well as they could be doing to get better. Right. You know, if, they're, if they go missing in an 11v11, they don't understand maybe the tactical requirements of it right. when they're playing in a unit of four or five players instead of three or four players as a, you know, on a five-a-side pitch where there isn't a great deal of structure. Mm-hmm. So, and I think it's probably just exposure and maybe experience. You know, some might just not enjoy playing 11v11 because it's one, too much commitment. Two, they don't think the exposure is that good for them. They might have had negative setbacks. They come to play five a side where it's unstructured, isn't it? Other than yeah, referee, yeah, yeah, yeah. it's a bit like street football and they can just express themselves and not fear judgment and they're going to play. So I think, but there are, you know, futsal is a big sport that's yeah, becoming that's more prominent. I used to um, love futsal. Yeah, it's great, isn't it? But it? There's nothing down here, is there, in Plymouth? No, no. We used to just do it for um, training at Modern yeah, for years. It's a great yeah, game. Yeah. It's a completely different game than the 11-11 format in terms of structure and kind of tactics. But there are people that flourish in that. Yeah, yeah, that's 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 what my mind goes back to. Is a few lads that were like unbelievable, mate, unbelievable like technique, skill, mm. shooting, everything. And then on a Saturday they would come and they just they just wouldn't be the same player. And it's just always baffled yeah. me as to why. You know what I mean? Why is that? But again, it's like you said, it might not be that they might have been playing in the street for most of their lives. They never, may not have been able to go to those eleven aside yeah. games that growing up and and all those different types of things. But and I think it goes back to um, like with the Littlands as well with five. 5- five aside futsal it's like it's 4v4 5v5 so it's very small sided football yeah. they're getting loads of touches of the ball you know when we see um, younger players playing 8v8 9v9s I think the, 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 if we if we go let's go a 3v3 versus a 9v9 whilst it might not be a proper football match um, their son's probably going to get about 500% more touches of the ball or daughter and 500% more exposure of 1v1s defending and attacking so why not do that for as long as possible, especially in the early years, to let them grow and understand and learn how to wriggle free and escape pressure. And, you know, it's, and the other thing about small-sided football for me is you can't hide. 
So if you want to get better at something, you need to expose yourself to a situation where you're responsible and you have a contribution to play in that scenario, whether it's 3v3, 2v2, 1v1. Whereas if you're in a 9v9, you can hide a little bit and be part of the winning side. Yeah. No, you can't. Yeah, you definitely. Don't want that. Is it, is it, yeah. You know what it's like in five-a-side. If, you, if you've got a good five-a-side team against another good five-a-side team, if you've got one weak link... yeah. And they've yeah. got that. Their yeah. players like yeah. worthy. Yeah. Yes, it, it. You can't win, can you? Massively, because yeah. it, you cannot hide. Yeah. And doesn't it expose that player? Not in a. I'm yeah. not saying from a negative perspective. What it does is it allows you to highlight, highlight frailties yeah. Yeah. more. And you go, okay, well, I've got a body of work to do here now. So if I'm doing it with a child, I wouldn't expose them and say you're not good enough. I would then probably put them either as a magic player, what we call like a player who play for both teams, or deliberately overload their team. So if we were playing 3v3 and it was so one-sided, I'll make it a 5v3. So they're getting a, they've are got more players and they're just getting a little bit more exposure and they get a bit more success. And that's when we might have a little bit of crossover in abilities as well. Yeah. So. And how about um, as they get older, would that, would that then change the design of your practice? It will do. As they get older and, f and physically stronger, you can do a bit more and you can require more of them, I think. Yeah. Um, you know, practice design, well, that's one of my kind of big passions, practice design. I'm a bit of a nerd when it comes to practice designs because I, I watch a lot of football and if it's on the telly, I'll, I'll pause it. It's a bit geeky, but I'll pause it and then I'll go up to the screen and I'll draw a box around that situation. Not a physical box, just with my finger really. And I go, okay, and I'll, tr I'll create a practice from that box okay. because it's a remnant of the game. Mm -hmm. And one of my big kind of go-to moments when I've done some coach education work for the FA is that, is that if I can't pick up a practice in training and drop it in the game, yeah. why am I doing it? That's one of my biggest things. I, I remember years and years ago, we were um, doing some coaching drill and they'd done uh, like an attack versus defense scenario thing. And I remember I was a striker and I was up front pretty much on my own. And it was the most pissed off I've ever been in a training <laughs> session ever because our defense at the time was quite sound. And... I don't know I was just so isolated and we were doing it for about half an hour yeah. and it was just you know patterns of play and stuff like that but at the time I was only like 21, 22 but I couldn't understand what the coach was trying to do because what he was trying to do is why is Danny so isolated mm. why, why on a Saturday is he becoming so isolated and we were working on this pattern of play but every time I was getting the ball boom someone was on me two people on me two people on me and then we worked through it and then he pulled me to one side after and he was like look we need to isolate these different areas is that not actually you yeah. it's not actually you at this point we need to get the ball to you and we're, when we're playing on a Saturday you're doing one bit of moment of magic or this or that but for 60% of the game we're not even getting you near it and, yeah. and we're not supporting as, as a team and honestly I was, I was fuming did but, you understand it afterwards though? yeah I did yeah but at the time mm. I was like do you know what I mean? I was just like, just couldn't get my head around it. Do you think, I mean, that's a really interesting narrative. Do you think then, if he'd have said to you at the start, look, I'm going to use you in this space today. This is what's going to happen. This is why we're doing it. Yeah, Do you he think that would have helped you to understand it better? I think he kind of did. I think, I think he said something like that, but mm. he didn't explain it in a way where sure. it yeah. was specific towards me because everyone else is getting bored and playing. Yeah. And I was just kind of bobbing around and fighting for scraps and bits <laughs> and pieces. And then as well, what he'd done is he had took away um, my part of the game, where, which was to shoot and score. So there was like no goalkeeper. Yeah. It was like, get to this point get it to him if he beats the line or we get it to this point of the pitch then you give it back and it starts again so it was it, yeah but it, it was it was fine but it just always reminds me of something like yeah, that like sure. where I, I look back and I think yeah you know if I understood the game more from a younger age then I wouldn't have yeah. wouldn't have been like that but I think kids now are because yeah. that sort of coaching yeah. I, I wasn't getting coached like that until my probably mid-20s when I was young my coaching was right. We're going to run around a pitch. Yeah, oh, yeah. we're going to play five aside, mm -hmm. or we're going to play um, just a game. Yeah. We would do some old school drills, old school fitness. Do you know what I mean? Our preseason used to be like go up Central Park, and we're going to run until you're sick <laughs> at like fourteen, <laughs> fifteen. You know, and that that's how we used to do it. And it's so completely different. Yeah, you've got to think about why we're running. I know we get a base fitness in, but kids, you know, you can do your run you can run with a ball. Do it with a ball. Do it with a ball. Maximize. <laughs> The do a half test awesome. yeah exactly do just, a half test they're, they're actually they're actually quite fun they're great aren't they yeah yeah, yeah they're good just yeah just ball mastery back in 100 percent see a half test yeah what's that? yeah it's like an aerobic track so you'll do like a four minute on four minute off four minute on where you'll just do a series of ball activities whilst building a base aerobic fitness right 
Yeah, um, but like... because you're engaged with the ball, you're just doing, you know, like kind of SAQ, but not at speed. You're kind of just plodding yeah, along, aren't you? Yeah, yeah, and it's it's good. Yeah, it's just... and it's a published piece, so it's a it's a recognised official test that you can do as part of preseason. Yeah, we we always used to start off with a Hoff test. Yeah, you know, oh, Chris Tanker used to. It's me, it's so yeah, me. yeah, 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 yeah. With you, you know, and it's just, I just think you know the modern game now. I think we can, irrespective of whether we're volunteers or not. I still think we've got an obligation to learn about the the, the people we're working with. You know, I, I I teach at this at uni a lot, and I say to the to the students, don't just jump on YouTube and find Pep Guardiola Rondo and use that. You know, we need to we need to meet the needs of the learners that are in front of us, and we do it in three ways, in my opinion. We improve our self awareness as a person. What is it we need to do? We try to find, you know, within within reason, evidence informed practice design, and we do it to meet the needs of the learners. And under nine is not Kevin De Bruyne. You know? <laughs> so whilst we all want to be like Messi and things like that, they're, they're nine years old. We need to understand what the language they resonate with. You know, I, I started, you know, the, I find my, my strength, I think, is like 14s and up. That's where I see my, my best strength. So, you know, over a year ago, I had to take at the IFA to take like the under sevens and eights. And it's hard because my going from an academic standpoint, you know, during the day, I'm an academic and I'm using posh words and things like that. I've got to change my my language to work with these seven year olds who think about Buzz Lightyear and you know and all Mario and all. And I'm like, right, okay, what does that look like? And I remember doing a practice. We were trying to do setting the trap, you know, like trying to. And I'm thinking, what am I doing setting the trap with the kids? So I turned it around. I was like, what were they like? And I, they understood what a sheepdog did, right? And what the job of the sheepdog was to herd the sheep into a pen. And we just played like sheepdog. We called it, <laughs> you know. So who's the sheep? I want to be the sheepdog, right? Your job is to like just usher people into that space to allow the wolves who were the kids to come in kind of running yeah. Yeah. and I thought wow if I'd have tried to deliver that in a UEFA A level way yeah. they'd have been going like what 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 I have no <laughs> idea spinning around looking at the stars but because it was a sheepdog and the, well, can I be the wolf you know it's yeah. it brilliant so you know that that I that I struggled with that for a long time because you know someone as experienced as I am I struggled with learning the language yeah. to work with like key stage one children which I don't envy it with people that do it. I take my hat off to them and do it day in, day out. Yeah, it's a definitely a different skill set. Isn't oh, it? it's massive. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, so the coaching thing then, so make it relevant to the game. Um, you, you sort of talked through some really good drills there. Um, going back to that sort of annoying parent on the sideline thing from a coaching perspective. Yeah. Any advice to coaches on how to manage parents like that? Involve them, I'd say. Inv- if, you're, if you're a manager of a club, start of the year, get the parents around and involve them and say look you're very much part of our journey don't create tension and set and almost have a charter to say like this is who we are don't use this is what we i am this is what we need from you this is who we are if we use the term we it means we're involved so you are our are an ambassador for our football club therefore we we expect to behave in this way get the players involved as well think of it as a triangle it's not the coach versus the player and the player versus the parent and the parent versus the coach. We're all in it together. So whilst a parent might get emotionally involved, saying something based on emotion, which prompts more of a reaction rather than a response, might not be the best thing to do at that time. Yeah. So it's a case of, and almost holding each other to an account. If you get parents in, you say, look, we're in this together, even if you get them something to sign, like you sign a charter to say, I'm fully invested in this. You can have a voice, provided it's done in this way. Yeah. You know, I'm, and I'm not saying that's the way it should be done, but that's how I would do it if I was running a football club. But definitely involve them because they're very much part of the journey. If coaches are with a child from under nine through to under 16, that's part of their youth, isn't it? You're with them for six, seven years. Yeah. You know, you're a secondary attachment figure to them and their parents are there as well. So involve them and make them feel valued. And if you can do that, I think you'll get better buy-in. Yeah, they have such an influence as well over the children, don't Massive. they? So if they're, they're moaning at home, or they're moaning on the sidelines to take him home. Oh, you, you like it there? No. And what that creates then is is that bit of tension. I've yeah. seen it a few times now. It creates that bit of tension where they don't, the kids then have their head turned. They're not the same player. They're not playing the same, you know, and it all stems from maybe, you know, their, their parents are not happy with the position they're playing or the amount of game time or the game time someone else is getting. Yeah. And, you know all those types it's, of things, it's and, a, it's, and it's a and it's thankless it's, task. Isn't it, it is, yeah, and it's they don't realise all the effort and uh, stuff that people put in behind the scenes to get yeah. that. You know, and yeah, it it is what it is. At the end of the I day, I think it goes back to communication as well, Dan. Like from a parent's perspective, like don't 
don't have secret societies, go and speak to the coach and say, can I have a word? Like, this is how we're feeling. And they might go, oh, I was completely, I'm, I'm sorry, I wasn't even aware. You know, I'm really sorry about that. Thanks for bringing that to my attention. Let's work together to build it. And I think on the flip side is parents, you know, the, the post-game car journey is where the interrogation starts. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and I think, do we need to be saying that? You know, if, they're, if they know they've had a bad game, they probably know. Yeah. Perhaps just leave them to it. Yeah. And then just say, you're right. Yeah, fine. And maybe distract them and then have a chat, or, you know, a day later or something. But the more we can talk, I think from a mental health perspective, you know, that's more evident than ever now isn't it i think children suffer with mental health issues as well but making them feel valued and making them feel that do you know what it's all right when you get things wrong it's all right to fail it's fine um if you if you expect perfection they're never going to express their true selves because they fear the the mistake that follows yeah yeah and on 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 that slightly the sort of overall attitude um i guess of of, of young kids what 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 do you think that should look like to produce the, the best outcomes? Be positive, be respectful. Absolutely. You know, again, they're for me, the majority of products are their environments, but be, be willing to learn. Mm. You know, if you, if we're looking at it from a football context, you know, you want to be the best player. Well, who's, what right do you have to be the best player? You know, it's not just about turning up on a Saturday and, and playing a game. You know, do you study the game? The one thing I, I work with, especially older players who are moving into the 11 v 11, like 13, 14, I'll, I'll say, well, who do you model yourself? You know, who's your favourite player? Messi. All right. Well, you're, <laughs> you're a right back. So wh- why is Messi your best player? Oh, he's brilliant at scoring goals. Well, what can you take from Messi that you can apply to your position? Well, nothing really then. All right. Well, why don't we admire Messi as a player, as a great, but actually start looking at role models in my position hmm. that I can take the best bits from and create my platform that way? Yeah. You know, so especially with the academy boys, I like, well, look at the first team players. I think foot, Argyle's foot first team now are brilliant. I think they've come on so well. And they play such good football, oh, mate. The other night, I thought God. they were fabulous. That first know. half, they were so slick. I yeah. was like, I was, my lad was watching it and he was like, are they always play this well? I was like, Phew. <laughs> 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 they, play, they play well this half, yeah, mate. And yeah, then the yeah. second half rocked around. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it was a bit of a <laughs> yeah, dead it was dance flat, wasn't it? it? But, but that's testament to um, them playing first half, you know, and taking yeah. the, the sting. Well, it was gone, wasn't it? The game was gone. It could have been five first half. You know, and 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 like model yourselves on them and go and ask there's a couple of boys who've just gone in as scholars and i i keep communication channels open with them like how you doing yeah yeah, good um who do you admire like oh such and such go and talk to them what they do off the pitch you know what can i ask a question like you know after a game what what do you do oh i know one or two of them for example really analyze their game and sit down and go through it and write things down and they they write targets and they eat well and they sleep well and you know they don't they don't live a life of you know, partying and stuff like that. If you if you think about a modern day footballer, yes, we, we see we see the top end, we see the money they get, we see the glamour, the glitz and all things like that. But the ones who are, re- the reason why they can maintain it is because they're so disciplined at what they do, as we know. Yeah. You know, and even the, the boys that are playing, you know, they might not be high end Premier League players, but they're, they're very disciplined at what they do. And if you want to make it, as you know, if you want to make it, you've got to invest. Mm-hmm. It's not, I don't, I don't like the word sacrifice. I like the word invest. If you want to be good at something, invest in it. Don't sacrifice, no, I'm going to sacrifice that to do that. I appreciate you need to make a decision, but I'm going to invest my time in this. Mm -hmm. And if I'm going to have a go at it, I need to learn more about it. And if you can't learn about it, you can't expect others to do it for you. Mm -hmm. So, you know, going back to that that question about the player, what, what attributes do you have currently that make you a valued member of your team? Mm -hmm. What things do you need to improve on to keep you consistently playing in that team? Yeah. And then who do you model yourself on? You might admire the best players in the world, but who do you model yourself on? Why do you model them? And if you've got similar attributes, learn from it. Watch them, study them, watch how they move, watch how they take the ball. Yeah, great. Um, you touched on um, something there that I just want to go back to, um, just around sort of the stuff you do outside of the game. So sleep, nutrition. Yeah. Is that stuff that younger players need to worry too much about? I think so. Obviously sleep, but yeah. like nutrition, yeah. is, that a big, is that a big thing? I think massively, I think it really is. If you eat well, you know, it affects our mood, it affects our hydration levels, it affects how, you know, our performance levels and things like that. Um, not so much as a an eight-year-old, you know, but is they're getting, if they're starting to take things a bit more seriously, when they're like 13, 14, 15, they're starting to grow, you could be doing all the training in the world, but if you're not sleeping and resting and eating well, then that's only going to hinder, you know, what you put in your body, you know, is fuel, yeah. is your engine, that, that, you know, your body works. 
and it's the fuel that goes into the engine that allows you to perform on game day. Yeah, hundred percent. We probably haven't got time to get into that because it's an absolute rabbit hole. It's yeah, nutrition. Sure. But is there, are there any good resources out there that might support parents with information around you know sort of correct nutrition, hydration for football and that type of thing? I think there's a there's some good. I haven't got on the top of my head like some good articles that are worth looking at. But there's there's a there's an applied nutrition website which is quite useful. There's also a youth nutrition website. I think which just provides articles that are quite low key in terms of language for, for, for parents in particular to learn more about healthy eating. But I don't think you need particularly, um, you don't need websites that are specifically designed around sports, just well-being, you know, good nutrition. What does that look like for, for sports people or active people? Um, the one thing I have uh, with, with parents as well is making sure the child rests because they assume that like more means better. So, you know, we they go on holiday. Well, when your child goes away, oh yeah, they're going to do a running program. No, just go and lay down on a beach for a bit, go and rest. And they forget sometimes that when they're recovering and they're resting, they're actually growing. Yeah. And they're actually getting better, you know, because they're allowing their bodies to adapt as we know, and we're sleeping, and we're getting good kind of rest periods, recover. You don't need to play football seven days, 24 seven, seven days a week for fear of missing out of becoming a pro or becoming the best version of yourself. So what, what is the ideal frequency for, for playing football then across a week, perhaps? And I know it will vary depending yeah. on the athlete, but generally speaking. It's, it's hard to say, isn't it? It's, I, I don't think there's a, it's this or nothing. Yeah. It's, I think it's regularity, but it's also not overloading the body. I know some children that will play Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday, and then maybe train Monday. And you think that's probably too much. Mm -hmm especially doing the same sport. And I think they fall, they become victims then of just a vicious cycle of doing kind of endless activity rather than growth activity. I, I like the idea of not training on a Friday night if they're playing on a Saturday. And I feel a bit of a hypocrite because one of the places I work at train on a Friday night. But if I had a choice, we wouldn't train on a Friday night because I think if, especially the older kids, not so much the little ones, but the older ones, they need to rest. They recover. You know, you don't see professional athletes training Friday night for a Saturday game, do you? Mm. So I think Friday nights should be just chill out night and things like that. Um, I think they can train Monday, but normally you know, the start of the week, isn't it? Monday is the first one after the weekend. Um, Wednesday is normally the middle part of the, the week, isn't it? When they train, so Tuesday, Wednesday, but not not too much. Yeah. You know, a lot of kids now play for two teams. They play a Saturday and a Sunday, yeah. and I can't get my head around that. I don't, don't understand it. But why do they need to? So that means they'll do a development centre maybe once a week. They do a Saturday side training Tuesday, a Sunday side training Wednesday, play Saturday, play Sunday, school football starts to become a little bit yeah I remember I was like I was about 16 I was playing for the adult football schoolboys this that the, you know my Saturday team my mm. Sunday team you know I was playing I, I remember I played for um, I played up at the you know um, Wessex yeah at Wessex yeah, yeah so remember the old Wessex team yeah. so I played I was playing for Lee Moore just helping out and I remember it was the seventh day in a row I had an 11 a side game. Wow. And I couldn't move. No. I, I started playing. I was only like 17. I couldn't yeah. move. And I was no. like, and I'm went young, off half, you were young. Yeah, yeah. I went off half time and I was like, just not playing. And, and I guess if you experience that week in, week out, you very quickly get despondent, right? And just think, fuck this, it's too Tell much. Tell you what, I got about 15. Yeah. I played a lot of football through those years. And I got, um, I don't know, I probably ruined the time, but Oscar, Oscar Salatis or whatever. Oscar Salatis, yeah. Yeah. So I got that on the end of my top of my shins and in yeah. your knee. And that was horrendous. I had that, I couldn't even walk can't even walk and that's it's common around about that age anyway because it's a growth thing isn't it thing, it's a growth yeah. thing where the bones are growing and it's the muscles aren't as flexible as it should be and it pulls on the tendon and it just starts to peel away and they're like micro tears aren't they yeah the it's bone. micro tears yeah and it's, it's disgusting because as well though at the time i was everyone was like oh I still play I still play mm -hmm. so i was pushing myself through playing and in the end i end up in going a and e because i couldn't even walk <laughs> yeah i think the flip side as well is if you if children did a bit less when it comes to them playing, they might be more hungry to go for it. They yeah. look forward to it. Like, oh, I'm not going to play for two days or three days. I can't wait for training. If they're playing every day. Yeah. I know some people have got passions for it. I'm not saying you should, you should or shouldn't be doing it. But just if we, if, we, if we think that we've got to do more to get to the top, yeah. not at the early age, there's no, there's no formula out there that says by this age, if you haven't done X amount of training hours, you're not going to make it. There's nothing out there. You know, everyone's journey is different. You know, when we talk about professional football, you need a hell of a lot of luck. 
you know, everyone who's made a pro, you know, fair play to them, they're professional footballers. But I, I've known and played with tons of footballers who were good enough to be pros, but just didn't get that chance. Yeah. You know, it doesn't mean you're a bad player, but it's, you know, you, you want to give yourself the best chance, but luck plays a massive part of... So, you know, so many factors in there. Yeah, it's it's it even, even a coach at a certain time believing in you. I know Gary was saying that he had a coach that believed in him at a certain point of his yeah, career and it, yeah. and it, and it put you him through. give him one chance. But he you said, his, it, didn't he say his bro brother was better than him, but he didn't make it or something like yeah. that? I'm pretty sure he said yeah. that. And, you know, exactly. It's crazy. He, you know. Yeah, mate, that's been brilliant today. Is there anything that we've, we've not touched on that you think is key to mention? Not really. I've really enjoyed it. First and foremost, thanks for the invite, chaps. Um, just yeah, just just develop. You know, from a parent's perspective, try to understand the child that you're working with. You know, your child, but other what they look like in their space. Communicate more, and um, try to if you're going to go into coaching, try to try to think about your practices and how they relate to the game. That's all I'd say. Yeah, brilliant, mate. Yeah. Thank you. Take take a second to just sort of explain again your services, what you offer. Tell us a little bit about the... Uh, the, the oh, the Grip Socks, yeah. yeah. So, I mean, as part of my ATEC coaching, which started post-COVID, this is my more kind of specialist development program. So I work with, you know, players who are perhaps on more of a development program. You know, I'm not uh, a community-level coach. So I get a lot of messages from people wanting kind of one-to-ones for... You know, in my opinion, a six-year-old doesn't need a one-to-one. -one. That's my opinion. But the others will do that. That's up to them. But they come to me for specialist development, so position-specific. So we do a lot of small group work. Um, I work with quite a few of the first-team pros at Argyle and have done. Um, so that, you know, it, I, I build my brand on quality and education. So I, I, I'm, I'm really, you know, a big stickler for, for demanding quality and then last year um, I was training in the heat and I was like my feet are a little bit hot there must be a specialist pair of socks out there so I went and bought a pair of grip socks and I was like well they're all right and then for some reason I thought I can make my own version I reckon and then at 12 months on that's these so I've uh, created my own grip sock version which uh, these are their fourth version so we've had prototypes made feedback from pros who have worn them they're a bit thick they're a bit thin that's a bit tight that's not too tight that's you know and this is what they are so these are my ATEC brand socks now and you know I'm very thankful that six of the, the first team boys in Argyle are wearing them Brilliant. For, for match days and training and stuff like that so I'm very thankful for them and they're starting to kind of get a bit of traction excuse the pun um, in the uh, in the local sector and so much so I've branched off into kind of running socks and kind of golf socks as well. So no, so what makes them different to other traction socks? They're just, so they're, they're of a design that have been created by me. So they're not just an off the shelf sock. Yeah. So these are, so these ones in particular, well, the colored ones, these are a lot thinner than normal. They're a lot um, snugger of, in terms of fit. They're tighter. The grips are smaller. So a lot of the feedback I've had from the pros is that when they've worn, worn other brands, they can feel the grip. Right. But these you can't, and they do a job. Um, I've just got them into cricket as well. So I was speaking to a player last night who plays cricket. He's a bowler. And a lot of cricketers, fast bowlers, have a tendency to cut a hole in their shoe with their landing leg. Right. Because it, you know, their toe slides against the shoe and it causes their... Toe. Okay, yeah. And he's been wearing them for like a month and he hasn't cut his shoes. So it's just, they, they definitely work. But I wouldn't have exposed them to the public if I didn't think that they were good quality. Yeah. So I'm very proud of that product. Um, but yeah, so that's that's kind of a, a little side hustle, really, that goes with it. But that's who I am. Brilliant. And where can people find you? Um, uh, my Instagram handle is Coaching Atech. So have a look on that. That's the one I'm mainly on. I've got uh, a TikTok account, which I don't understand TikTok. It blows my mind. But it's Atech Performance. Um, and they can catch me by our email on um, Atech coaching at gmail.com brilliant yeah great stuff mate well thanks again for coming on no mate. worries a great thanks chat, for the invite thank you have a good day cheers Zach.